Thank you, Monica. season is going to be celebrated as the centennial of, of uh, a Toronto club in the National Hockey League. And so there'll be all kinds of celebrations through the course of the year and, and uh, special events that will take place. I'm going to talk today about what I claim is the most important goal in Toronto Maple Leafs history. Scored by Bill Barocco. We know the story for the most part, April 1951. Here we go. Here we go. This is me in 1959. So Bill Barocco he is born in Timmins, Ontario, and March 25th, 1927. He's the son of Steve and Theodosia. Whoops, want to go back? Sorry. Sorry, how do I go back? Sorry. Itchy trigger finger. There we go, sorry about that. So Steve and Theodosia had, uh, it was an arranged marriage. They had uh, got married in Canada, but they came from Eastern Europe. And they came on the promise that Canada was the promised land, that it was, uh, the, the roads were paved with gold, it was going to be incredible. They land and go to Timmins, Ontario, where Steve's brother was, and they find out that the uh, roads are paved, not with gold, but with gold. Uh, Steve is the, the cook in one of the mining camps that was up there at the time. Uh, Theodosia, who went by the name Faye, was uh, a stay-at-home mother. And soon the mother of three children. The first child born was Alex in 1926, Bill, as we mentioned, in 1927, and a couple of years later, 1930, actually, uh, a daughter by the name of Anne was born. And there they are as youngsters. Billy's the one on the left, clearly, Anne in the middle, Alex on the right hand side. So they were a very close family. Alex, a little bit older, uh, was, was firmly entrenched in sports at that time. He was a terrific athlete, quite well known within the city for his baseball exploits, he was a hockey player as well, terrific track and field athlete too. The youngsters, Bill and Ann, seemed to spend more time together at that particular time. They were both athletic to some extent too, but not like their big brother Alex, who they idolized at that particular time. So time went on and, and uh, Bill was not a great student, very candidly. Bill's interests, as we foreshadow a little bit, were airplanes. He would watch the, uh, the, the planes flying over the area in Timmins and fishing. Ironically, fishing was something he enjoyed doing, but he, he couldn't stand the taste of fish, both uh, apocryphal as well. Bill uh, was not a great student. He spent three years in grade eight. Uh, for the most part, he skipped school and went and, and really worked on playing hockey. He was actually a pretty good hockey player earlier on. They put him in goal, though. He was a terrible skater. They put him in goal. He wore uh, glasses, and they were those pop bottle glasses. Well, not just some of them. Um, and uh, they put him in goal, and he was quite a, a good schoolyard goaltender, and they played against other schools, too. Did very, very well. In the meantime, Alex was, uh, was playing competitive hockey and, and doing terrific things at that time. Alex was realizing, sorry, rather, Bill was realizing that Alex was uh, getting the accolades. Uh, he was, uh, was doing quite well with himself, and Bill decided that he too wanted to play hockey like his big brother. So Alex said, well, look at, you know, Bill, first off, you always complain about the fact that your feet are cold. You're playing goal in boots. Uh, it's time for you to learn how to skate and learn how to skate properly. So when he was skipping school so much, especially in that eighth grade that we mentioned, 
three times. Uh, he was in fact going down to the local rinks and, and uh, really working on his skating. Not his greatest attribute throughout his entire career, but improved enough that he actually progressed to the ranks fairly quickly. This may have been uh, an appropriate year to, uh, to think about how Bill's career was launched. It's a band called a band, sorry, this is a, a team called the Holman Pluggers, a juvenile team up in Timmins. A terrific juvenile team as well. There's a number of players in that uh, picture. Well, Bill's the one who circled on the far left side. He wasn't on the team at that time, at least in not an official way. But there were several players who were. Pete Babando, who went on to some fame with the Detroit Red Wings. Eric Prentice had a cup of coffee with the Maple Leafs as well. Alan Stanley, who certainly had a terrific uh, Hall of Fame career as well. And uh, Alex Barocco as well were just some of the, the better players on this particular team. Bill was the stick boy. He wanted to hang out with his big brother and uh, all of his pals, but because he had some background in playing goal, Bill uh, was the, the backup goalie for all intents and purposes. They needed a target. For the most part, they only had one goaltender, so they needed a target for the other end, so Bill would play goal. But that's when he really realized that, you know, what, what I really want to do is progress beyond being the stick boy and, and going from there. So he had worked on his skating, like I said, and went on to play with a team called the Timmins Canadians. Here he is with his best friend. Second from the left is a gentleman named Leo, Leo Couric, rather. Leo never made it to the National Hockey League. He was chattel of the Toronto Maple Leafs, but he had a terrific American Hockey League uh, career. Uh, Leo was Bill's best friend from the time they were toddlers, right through to the very end of, of Bill's life as well. So, one of the things that was happening during that era was the number of scouts. Did I just lose the mic? No, we all right? Uh, was the number of scouts, I'm yelling loud enough anyway. Um, sorry. The number of scouts who came up to Northern Ontario, there was a, an influx of, of scouts, thanks very much, of scouts, but also of great talent up that way as well. And, and certainly, the, each of the teams had one principal head scout, but they had what we call Bird dogs, sorry, there we go. Bird dogs, and local guys who were sportsmen who would indicate to the head scouts some of the talent that they had down there. And so one of the scouts who was up there, actually he was a coach down in Pittsburgh, was a gentleman named Johnny Mitchell. Had a career as well, he played in the National Hockey League too. But Johnny Mitchell was up there, as were other scouts too, and noticed that uh, the Barocco brothers were actually pretty good. He signed a few others, or at least he wrote letters, talking about the talent that was uh, was up there, indicated that there might be something with the Barocco brothers, and in fact the Barocco brothers wrote a letter to Mitchell too, asking if, if they could come down to camp. Well, they were invited to the, uh, the Pittsburgh Hornets training camp. Um, the Pittsburgh Hornets at that time were a tier below the Toronto Maple Leafs. They were the American Hockey League affiliate. Below the Hornets was the USHL, you, you know, uh, excuse me, United States Hockey League team, the Tulsa Oilers. Below that was the next level of play with the Hollywood Wolves. They were the Pacific Coast Hockey League. They were loosely affiliated with the Toronto Maple Leafs, but uh, they still were, they were a minor pro team, but they were the fourth level below the National Hockey League, I guess the third level below the National Hockey League as well. So when Bill and Alex didn't make the Pittsburgh Hornets in training camp in 1945, both were sent to the Pacific Coast Hockey League. Ironically, Alex ended up playing with the Oakland Oaks, a competitive team. Bill played with the Hollywood Wolves. First time that either of them had ever been on a plane before, even though Bill had enjoyed very much looking at planes, he'd never been on a plane before. Poor family, he just didn't have the opportunities, of course. It was a whole different era. Bill's on the Hollywood Wolves at this time, and uh, interesting things happen. He, he was under the tutelage of the coach, Bob Grayson, who played with the Toronto Maple Leafs, and another guy who uh, played defense named Tommy Anderson. Tommy had been a Hart Trophy winner for the Brooklyn Americans, 41-42, was now playing, ironically he was uh, part of the uh, Maple Leafs organization, but having won the Hart Trophy, never got a chance to play in the National Hockey League again. He was a uh, defenseman on the Hollywood Wolves. They really worked with Bill on his, uh, on his skating and on his defensive abilities. Gracie did as well. Bill became a real favorite in town. He was one of those gentlemen like, uh, I guess I'll say Darcy Tucker, who left it out on the ice every single shift, even though Tucker was a forward, don't get me wrong, but was aggressive, uh, had some skills as well, but he became really uh, popular amongst those who were, uh, who were going to the games at the Pan Pacific Arena at that time. Other thing was they had a great PR director, and that's really important to any team, of course. 
But when you're in Hollywood, there are some opportunities that other teams don't have. So because Bill was, you know, blonde and a good-looking boy, strapping hockey athletic guy, he was the, uh, he was, they were calling him Hollywood Bill Barocco at that time. The PR director had some ins with, uh, with Hollywood motion picture PR people as well. So they would do facsimile relationships. Bill would have a, a starlet on his arm to go to different openings, different, uh, different events of that sort. It was great for Bill beautiful ladies on his arm. It was great for the Scarlet because she got into some, uh, some press that she wouldn't have had ultimately. They weren't relationships per se, but they were manufactured, but it got Bill in the paper all the time, which was terrific for him, terrific for the team as well, terrific for the Scarlet as well. Here they are, the training camp at 46. He's wearing number five, which was not the number that he started off with the Toronto Maple Leafs. He only wore that in his last season. So, you get the particular date, February, bear with me here, February 5th, 1947. I'm talking about Hollywood Wolves now, so please bear with me. February 5th, 1947, he's playing a game, he gets pulled out of the game. And, uh, and Bob Bracey, the coach, says, look at Bill, the, uh, the Leafs want you. Bill's head spinning around. Well, what had happened was the Leafs had some, uh, some injuries at that time. Bob Oldham had injured his, uh, his shoulder quite substantially. <laughs> Sorry about that. And uh, Garth Bush had uh, a groin injury. So they did what everybody would do at that particular time. They, they uh, replicated a defense core. Uh, they, first of all, they dropped Bud Coyle back to defense. That didn't work out so well. So they called Pittsburgh. Who have you got that you can send up? They were short at that time. There was some, uh, some influenza going through the, the staff at that particular time. So Pittsburgh couldn't help. They called Tulsa, Gus Marker, former NHL player as well. Can you help? It was the coach. Can you help us out? They were short right now. We're on a, a bit of a run right now. Can't help you out. So of all things, they go down to the Hollywood Wolves, called down to Gracie and said, is there anybody you can send up to us to uh, just to play for a handful of games just to fill in? Don't even know if they're going to play that much, but we just need another defenseman. And while they had some veterans, including Tommy Anderson, ironically, they had this kid, Barocco, and Gracie and Anderson uh, talked amongst themselves and said, you know what, he's green as the hills, which was the quote at the time, but you know what, if they need somebody for a handful of games, let's send them up. Con Smythe was open to it. His name was somewhat known within the Maple Leafs community, so they said, send Barocco up. And they did exactly that. They pulled him out of the game. The PA announcer announces that Bill Barocco is going up to the Toronto Maple Leafs. A huge roar of applause. People go crazy. And uh, Bill takes off his equipment and off he goes. He flies to Pittsburgh, first of all. And uh, from there, he takes a train up to Buffalo. And they told him when they got to Buffalo, first of all, there was a huge storm going on at that particular time in that area. But they said, you got to get down to Toronto. Bill, not knowing any better, jumped in a taxi and said, can you take me to Toronto? And the driver said, he can bet. And, uh, and drove him through this uh, snowstorm from Buffalo to Toronto so he could arrive in time to at least practice with the team once before the game on February 6th, the next day. He practices with his teammates, comes in confident, somewhat cocky. Uh, he started to body check, like that was his game at that particular time. The problem was he's body checking his teammates. They had to sit him down and say, look at Billy, you gotta, uh, you gotta pull back here because you're hurting our players, at least you're jeopardizing some of our players. So what he ended up doing is, if he was gonna body check somebody, he would steal from the roadrunner and meet me, and that would be the signal that I'm about to body check you, be prepared, and that was his uh, little signal to his teammates at that particular time. Guys like Howie Meeker certainly were on the other end of body checks, but they got the meet meep at least, so there we go. So Bill plays against the Montreal Canadiens, his very first game at the Forum in Montreal, February 6th, 1947. Makes a name for himself. They put him out on the ice as a regular defenseman. Makes a name for himself. He knocks uh, Elmer Locke ass over Ticato. Knocks Maurice Richard uh, into the next uh, next week. Bush Bouchard let him knock him over quite as well. But body checking these guys, they lost horribly. But Barocco gets his name in the paper for being uh, the, the star of the Leafs at that particular time. And uh, and what a great body checker he was. The next game he's going to be playing at Maple Leaf Gardens. So he calls his mom. First of all, she's still up in Timmins, and he said, Mom, I'm playing with the Maple Leafs. And she started to cry. And uh, he thought it was maybe tears of joy. No, she thought that the, 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 the top of the mountain was playing in Hollywood. I mean, 
where the movie stars are. And it was too bad that he had to take a step back. But don't you worry, my Billy. And he had to explain to, well, he had to explain to his sister, who explained to his mother, that uh, even though she didn't, under, his sister didn't understand either. He said, well, look at, I'm going to be on Hockey Night in Canada, and Foster Hewitt's going to say my name on Saturday night. And that's when they got it. And of course, when Ann went to the schoolyard the next day, all the kids were talking about how, how local boy made good Bill Burrell was going to be on the radio on Saturday night. So Bill plays with the Maple Leafs through that season. He's supposed to stay for four or five games. He stays for the entire season, and they win the Stanley Cup in 1947. They win the Stanley Cup again in 48. They win the Stanley Cup again in 1949 as well. And he becomes a favorite. He's a terrific, uh, terrific addition to the team. He's aggressive. His skating, as I said, was uh, something to be desired, but he was doing the job, especially when they matched him up with Garth, Garth Bush on defense. They were a, a terrific uh, pair. And when you've got Jimmy Thompson and uh, Gus Mortson as the other defense pair, Wally Stanowski as your, your fifth defenseman, I, in many ways, you can parallel it to the big three of the Montreal Canadiens in the 70s or something, or even the Leafs in the 1960s with Bond, well, Brewer, Stanley, and Horton, but it was a, a terrific a blue line core. And Bill really makes a name for himself and very popular guy in town. Here he is doing an interview on CFRB, which was the dominant radio station at that particular time in Toronto. Good looking boy, playing the game with a great deal of grit. In the right hand side, you can see him facing the camera here. Also, notice that the, uh, the penalty box was such that they put both teams together in spite of the fact they just were slugging it out against each other. They win the Cup in 47, as I say. That's the elephant leg version of the, the Stanley Cup. They changed the, the style later on, but you can see some of the boys I mentioned. Jimmy Thompson on the left, half day, was the coach of the team at that time. Howie Meeker just to the right of him. There's Bill kneeling in the front. Vic Lynn in the back, Garth Bush, Gus Mortson, and, and uh, Joe Kluke in the back, too. One of the things that ends up happening is that Bill is so popular, and as Alex is too. Alex was playing with the Toronto Marlboro seniors at that particular time. So he didn't make it with the Leafs, but he was always hanging out with them. Everybody knew him as well. He was probably a better hockey player than Bill, very candidly, but never got that opportunity. But they got the offer from a Westinghouse uh, franchise owner to open up their own store, which they did on the Danforth not very far from the Danforth Music Hall, for those who uh, know or live in the Toronto area. It was an appliance store for all intents and purposes, but it was an amalgamation of so many things. Fishing rods, hockey equipment, 45 records, or so they wouldn't be 45s, they'd be 78s back at that time. Uh, records, they, all kinds of things that they were selling at that particular time. TV was just starting to come into, into vogue at that time. They had some of the first TVs in, in Toronto as well. Bill at that time never really did buy a house. He ended up living at the Eaton Hotel. Uh, today it would not be a desirable place for anyone to stay, but uh, at that time it was just down the street from where he was. He was able to walk for all intents and purposes, it would be a hell of a walk, but to Maple Leaf Gardens as well. And, uh, and that's where he lived at that particular time. Um, the store opening, you can see here, they had most of the team who was there cutting the ribbon. You can see his mom in the lower left, you can see his mom trying to peek up between Half Day and Bill Barocco. Turk Broda on the top with Harry Watson as well. Won't go through them all, but it was a big deal. The, uh, the, the road, the Danforth got closed down just because of the traffic from people who want to see all these hockey players. You have to remember that Leafs Nation isn't a recent, uh, uh, recent thing by any means. And the fact that one of the, uh, the popular Leafs was opening a store and that other Leafs were going to be there was big, big news at that particular time. Max Bentley, of all things, would be quite a bit older than Bill, but they became great friends. They were bonded through something uh, special for them, it was horse racing. Max was very, very much into the ponies, and he brought Bill into the fold as well. Uh, Bill got to be quite a gambler, when I say gambler, strictly with the, uh, the horses that way. But in fact, Max ended up helping franchise, sorry, uh, finance the fr a second franchise that they were going to own, never did open. It was going to be on Queen Street in the beach area of Toronto, but uh, they were going to be partners in a, another of the Barocco locations at that particular time. But they became terrific friends. Here's Alex trying out with the Leafs, but he ended up, as I said, playing with the uh, Toronto Marlboro seniors. 
And then we come to April 21st, 1951, a date that, although you may not know the specific dates, most of us have heard about one way or another. Bill Barocco, now in his fifth season with the Toronto Maple Leafs, they won the Stanley Cup, as I mentioned, 47, 48, 49. They missed in 50, Pete Babando, one of the gentlemen I mentioned earlier from the Holman Pluggers, scores the winning goal for Detroit in 1950. Uh, Toronto made it through just the first round. Sorry, got knocked out after the first round. But back in 51, here they go again, and, and uh, the Leafs are looking pretty good. Here's their chance. Terrific, uh, a terrific uh, series in the final against the Montreal Canadiens. Every single game goes into overtime. It is uh, it's dripping with drama all the way through, and it goes into game five. And uh, the Leafs are behind late in the third period. Al Rollins, their goaltender, he was platooning with Broda to some degree that time, but Al Rollins in goal gets pulled late in the third period. They send out a, another skater, it's Max Bentley, who's playing the point at that particular time, and uh, takes a shot, and ends up uh, going through a maze of players, drops down in front of Todd Sloan, who knocks it into the goal. They tie the game late in the third period. Here we go, here's the fifth overtime game of the, uh, of the series. April 21st, 1951, as I say, they go into overtime. Uh, Joe Primo, who now is the coach of the, uh, of the Leafs, tells, sits Bill down and says, okay, no gambling. Look, at, you've been uh, taking too many chances here. We can't take a chance that we're gonna lose this game. I don't want you to cross center ice. I want you to, to be a defensive stalwart back there. Don't cross center ice no matter what you do. Bill, yes sir, aye aye sir, and off we went. Well, two minutes and 53 seconds, into the overtime period. The puck goes in behind the net. You can see how he meeker back there. He, he uh, passes the puck out front, hoping to get it to Harry Watson, uh, but the puck hits Butch, uh, Butch Bouchard's ski and bounces up to the face-off circle. Bill Barocco's got a decision to make. Do I gamble and betray my coach, or do I go for it? He makes the decision, thank goodness the right one at this particular time, zooms in from the blue line, and uh, as he's diving, backhands the puck over Jerry McNeil's right hand shoulder, scores the Stanley Cup winning goal, April 21st, 1951. He's a hero beyond heroes. He's the guy, now you gotta remember, he's a defensive defenseman. He only scored 26 regular season goals throughout his entire career. It's not like he was a, uh, any kind of a, a Russian defenseman. Terrific, uh, we saw the previous one was a Tarovsky film. This is the lesser known one. Uh, Bill from the other angle, you can see that he knows the puck is in that particular net at that time. The irony too is that there were three shots that were taken. You have to remember the, these uh, speed graph cameras. You can see one on the right hand side, probably the Toronto Telegram's um, uh, camera at that particular time. But for them, the bulky cameras, for three of them all to capture that specific moment, or at least within fractions of a second, is just beyond comprehension, but they all got it. The other thing to remember, too, is that they were all in the proper end of the rink. What happens if Montreal had scored? None of them would be down there at that particular time. But they all captured it. They're all in the Hockey Hall of Fame as well. Immediately after the goal, this is a shot that I had never seen until very recently, but you can see Bill getting up after having dived. He, uh, he's getting up just beside Jerry McNeil, just to the left there. Howie Meeker still behind the net, but the puck is in the net, which is what counts for him. The celebration goes on. You can see Butch Bouchard on the right-hand side here talking to... can't remember his name. Doesn't matter. Um, darn. Anyway, uh, they're celebrating and having a great time here. Poor Jerry McNeil, who, who, whose daughter was actually born that day. Uh, here he is, leaving, forlorn, the Leafs in behind him, taunting, no, uh, is celebrating. Bill on the shoulders, Cal Gardner and Bill Juzda, Harry Watson on the right, celebrating. The story is probably one of those great urban legends, but is that Bill will never forget it. Give best to mom and hope you have a good time and rest you deserve it. Don't forget what you want in contract for next season. Uh, visit home in fall. Uh, Bill traditionally went home in the summertime to see his mom and his sister get some fishing in, uh, left the store to be run by a general manager at that particular time. Alex would join them a little bit later on, and that's really what happened too. Uh, here he is with his girlfriend, Louise, uh, Louise Hastings, went on to be married a couple of times, but Louis, Louise Carley, that was his, uh, his, as we understand, fiance. They were to get uh, engaged towards the end of the summer that, that particular year. Yes, sir. I think you'll be finished in about five minutes. Okay, yep. The very last photo of Bill, he's with uh, Alan Stanley's car. 
And then the drama begins. Dr. Henry Hudson was a, a sportsman at Timmins. He was a dentist, and uh, he was well known within the community for hanging out with the boys and for, uh, for a plane. He had a Fairchild 24 plane that he had. And he liked to take the boys fishing. Did that all the time through the course of the summer as well. Uh, his brother, Dr. Lou Hudson, was on the Canadian Olympic team much earlier. The problem was that uh, uh, Dr. Hudson was fairly careless when he was when he was flying as well, and was was known for taking chances. At any rate, he had invited Alan Stanley to go on a fishing trip with him, and uh, Alan was supposed to go, and then then didn't, and then he was going to take uh, Bill uh, just so he could get a, get a uh, one last uh, fishing trip in before the end of the summer as well. So it was going to be Lou Hudson, Dr. Lou Hudson, Bill, and uh, and. Henry Hudson as well. The plane was too heavy, so Lou said, look, you guys go, I'm going to stay back. So it was just Bill and, uh, and Dr. Henry Hudson who went to Seal River in northern Quebec to, uh, to fish for Arctic charms, which uh, the community loved. Apparently it tastes somewhat like, uh, like salmon. And they took the plane out of Fairchild 24 on August 24th, a Friday, and uh, caught a ton of fish on their way back. On the Sunday, they fueled up in, in uh, Rupert's house, Wasconaghish, in uh, northern Ontario. A gentleman named James Crawford, just a boy, uh, gave them uh, fueled up and asked if there's any chance he could get a fish. They gave him one of the best Arctic chars that they had at that particular time. And then that's the last they ever saw. James Crawford was the last boy. He was at the Hudson Boy Bay uh, Center there to, uh, to see him. They never came home. So, the Sunday night, there was supposed to be a goodbye party for Bill. He was supposed to come down to the CNE to do a signing in Toronto, and then, of course, training camp after that. Dr. Hudson had his practice to, uh, to, uh, to go to. They didn't show up on Monday. Party ended, they just sat around and waited for him to come back. They figured, well, maybe the, the fishing was so great, or maybe the weather was bad, they decided to hang in. Didn't come back, didn't come back, and uh, and they started to get worried after a couple of days. And uh, so the largest aerial search in, in uh, Canadian history, at least at that time, was underway. Uh, Con Smythe uh, put ten thousand dollars forward to for uh, as a reward for those who could give any information as to where his uh, defenseman was. Couldn't find them. Weather got uh, weather got bad towards the end of the summer. Uh, going into September and October, they kept Bill Stahl there. They didn't allow anyone else to wear the number five at that particular time. Uh, they still put his name in the program, but Bill didn't come back home. He was supposed to go to his, uh, his girlfriend's cottage at some point, didn't show up. They were supposed to get engaged on September 4th, which was her, her birthday. Uh, it wasn't until 1962, May 31st, 1962, that a gentleman named Gary Fields, uh, a pilot, happened to look down at that particular time. It was the most fortuitous time. There was a glint of silver down in the uh, in the forest around Cochrane, uh, about 60 uh, kilometer, I guess 60 miles north of Cochrane. Saw some metal there that didn't think should be there, and uh, so thought maybe there's something here at this time. I came back and said, I wonder if that might be that Barilco Hudson plane. They tried to go back and find it, and they couldn't find it. it. Took them some time. About a week later, they finally found it again. I'm talking about as they flew over top. So they wanted to mark the area so they wouldn't forget it. So they threw toilet paper out and just circled the area so they could come back and find it again. And they in fact, did they came back on uh, on uh, uh, June in June at that time. They they, they piloted or they uh, stopped about a, a mile away, walked in through the muskeg and the, the dense forest. And, Sure enough, they found the, the remnants of the plane, almost vertical in the ground. The skeletal remains of Hudson and, and uh, Barocco still strapped into the, uh, the cockpit. No fish that anybody could see. They were able to identify the plane by its number on the side, and, and uh, they found some, some attributes as well, buckles and, and teeth. Even though he was a dentist, they had no dental records for Dr. Hudson, but they did for Barocco. So the curse had been lifted. It had been 11 years. The leaves had been terrible. They hadn't, uh, they hadn't won the Stanley Cup again after that 1951 uh, championship that Barilko scored the goal. 1962, they won the Stanley Cup that year. The curse of Barilko had lifted, and, uh, and there we go. It's been 65 years. Why do we remember a guy who should be an asterisk? Well, one of the reasons is right here in Kingston, the tragically hip recorded a song called 50 Mission Cap, one of the songs, one of the, uh, the most played songs in Canadian music history. It was uh, based on a on a hockey card that James Duplessis, ironically, there's uh, Alex up in Bill's picture. Here are the remnants of the plane. I guess I should have remembered to do the slides. 
This is 1962 when they found the plane again. You can see the fuselage there. They had a, a ceremony for him, even though they didn't have any anything but uh, but his memories at that time. They actually uh, buried the bones later on. There's the team that won the cup in '62. So they put a Stanley Cup winning uh, card. That wasn't the one that James wrote at that particular time, but there was one that Bill had. This is the one that James actually wrote the text for. That Gord Downey here in the bottom right, who grew up in Amherstview, not very far from here, and the rest of the band from Kingston too, took that card James had written and basically recited it over a riff that the bass uh, player Gord Sinclair had come up with and put together that song, 50 Mission Cap. And because of that, as much as anything, we're all hockey historians, but uh, many of us are hockey or our music fans as well. That song has kept the memory of Bill Barocco some 65 years later on. They've gone back in, in 2005, they've pulled the plane out of, out of the uh, area in Cochrane. It's now resting in a, in a hangar in Timmins. They had hoped at some point to put it into a museum. Uh, there's some arguments about uh, where it should go, uh, but right now it's, it's just locked away. And, uh, the, the CBC has, has uh, done a piece on it, but really it's just there with decisions to be made. Uh, but there's the legacy, Bill Barocco and, uh, and the, the tragically hip, who kept the legacy alive with Bill's sister Anne. His, uh, his banner raised to the rafters in 1992, nobody's worn the number five since. Only two numbers have ever been retired, Ace Bailey's number six after the 1933 incident with Ace, with uh, Ace Shore and Bill Burrow goes as well. When they went back in 2005, they didn't put a sign on the area just so that people would know that two lives were lost. And there we go. The story of Bill Barocco and Stanley Cup winning gold, 1951. I'm so sorry, I didn't realize how long I'd gone. Pardon me. Here we go. Questions, comments, errors, omissions? Yes, sir. What's surviving? 